I hit silence, so you know. Oh, so hello. Yeah, somebody hello, should everybody. go. Um, yeah, this is. Uh, we are starting the uh, the the, uh, the the training session for the uh, for the women business angels. I welcome everybody. I see that uh, there are about a dozen uh, dozen or so people already online with us. It's uh, it's my honor to uh, to welcome you to this uh, kind of unusual format. Um, this is something that we've been doing in the past two years uh, quite often. Every month, uh, Esther and uh, company. Uh, organized these uh, these events uh, under the auspice of uh, women business angels um, and uh, obviously uh, due to the recent events uh, we're all aware of uh, because of the virus we have to go basically online and this is the I think this is the second uh, uh, event in that uh, in that series so um, things may change but our goal remains the same our goal is to uh, give a helping hand to uh, to angels or people who would like to be angels uh, in the uh, in the near future, um, the training is going to focus on uh, you know the most important um, lessons that we learned in the last ten years. Uh, the uh, the next fifty minutes, I'm going to focus on the the general context, uh, what you as an angel or um, or just uh, an aspiring angel. Uh, should uh, focus on and how you should uh, you, you should think about uh, investing into uh, either either startups or entrepreneurs or small businesses you name it uh, obviously the, it is going to require a little bit of a different mindset a little bit of different uh, uh, um, uh, um, different importances uh, uh, along the way but uh, in general um, I would like to give you um, uh, an idea uh, how you as an individual starting out as a, as a business angel, how you can navigate these, uh, these waters. Um, the other uh, major objective uh, of Women Business Angels is uh, to provide a supportive but professional environment uh, to those people who would like to uh, try their hands uh, at uh, investing into um, early stage companies, namely startups, but as, as I mentioned, um, the, 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 the format, the form of the business can be, can be many other things. Um, so uh, Esther asked me to uh, to definitely mention that Women Business Angels is going to hold, you know, in the in the future, are going to uh, continue to hold uh, various uh, um, uh, training sessions. Uh, so uh, if you would like to learn more about it, uh, obviously keep uh, uh, keep an eye out uh, for the for the new posts uh, on uh, the Women Business Angels uh, Facebook page. This. Uh, um, um, Presentation and this uh, this event is now taking place on Zoom, but it's also piped out to uh, to Facebook and it's uh, it's broadcast live. Uh, so I'm you know I'm saying hello to those who uh, who are joining us on, on on Facebook also. So without any further ado, and I promise to everyone everyone involved here, I promise that I'm going to keep it short, and uh, I really don't want to um, uh, you know uh, go into too many details uh, alone. I want to invite. Uh, uh, some of my uh, some uh, uh, some startup gurus and and people who are uh, very knowledgeable about this uh, this area also. So uh, I would like to open it up um, later on uh, to others uh, to uh, to share their thoughts uh, on these topics. Now um, now moving on, uh, let me share my screen uh, with you guys, and then uh, and then we can get uh, we can get started. So to uh, to those of you who uh, who who don't know me personally, uh, um, my name is Imra Hild. Uh, I've been uh, working with um, um, startups uh, basically since 2009. Um, in the uh, in the past 10 years, um, I've uh, I've built a number of um, of various uh, programs. Uh, two of them were uh, accelerators. One was iCatapult. The other one was uh, Digital Factory. In the process, I've seen somewhere around 500 startups. Uh, right now, I'm involved with eight of them. So, uh, um, along the way, uh, I've seen my share of uh, you know uh, successes and failures uh, in startup land. And uh, this basically, that's uh, this is a good background to uh, what I'm uh, I'm going to talk about today in terms of uh, angel investing. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, I'm involved um, uh, as a co-owner. Uh, I'm involved with four uh, startups uh, here, in, here in Hungary, and I'm also working with some uh, international regional uh, regional startups. Um, uh, since 2018, I'm uh, I'm, I'm also holding courses on on startup building, 
at Corvinus and at uh, and at uh, Budapest uh, uh, University of Economics. Now um, let me let's let's move on. Uh, so much is enough about myself. Um, now one of the fundamental things that I would like to uh, I would like to ask all of you is please check your assumptions at the door. Uh, what I mean by this is very often when I talk about you know angel investing or I just talk about you know startups and how to think about startups, what I realize is that many times people have some 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 specific idea or a specific company that they keep in mind and uh, they are listening to what I'm saying but they always keep in mind that the particular company uh, let's let's uh, let's just turn it upside down just listen to uh, what I'm what I'm trying to trying to tell you uh, all those uh, you know general uh, contextual statements and then later on uh, uh, focus on your specific uh, questions. Obviously, there will be opportunities along the way to ask your questions. Uh, you can you can type um, uh, questions in the uh, in the comment and chat section. And uh, Peter, uh, Eva, and Peter, uh, our two guests, uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, those questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So, but please keep an open mind. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a basic rundown on how. You know, angels should think about startups so based on the last ten years. Um, I I structured uh, what I'm going to tell you in in nine sections, and uh, I'm going to give you some smart tips uh, at the at the end. Uh, obviously, being very uh, gracious to those who are who are a bit late. Um, so, what is an angel? Well, uh, the angel, and I'm starting you out with uh, with this uh, with this uh, uh, image with this chart. An angel is, is a person who is in a very difficult position, as you can see. Uh, they typically meet a startup when they are not profitable yet. Uh, they may have a promise. They may have convinced a couple of people, those FFF, you know, that uh, I'm sure that many of you know that that stands for uh, family, friends, and fools. So they, they may have convinced a couple of people. So they are very, uh, uh, you know, they, they feel very smart. Um, and you are probably the first one who is not a friend or a friend or a family member and definitely not a fool uh, to join the company as a business angel. The business angel is very often taking the riskiest position. So you see that, uh, you know, we actually uh, highlighted the business angel section as uh, somebody sitting right on that crossing line when you are actually turning into profitability uh, from, uh, from being a loss leader. An angel, no wonder why it's called an angel. Uh, an angel is somebody who is uh, kind of saving the company, kind of uh, doing whatever they're doing based on trust and nothing but trust uh, by and large. So uh, uh, that's why this is a rather special situation, uh, not, not too formal um, and very, very much human based. Something that I learned in the last 10, 11 years is that actually investing is an HR business. You are actually investing in people, you're looking into that pair of eyes and you are either trusting that person or you're not. And if you don't trust the, trust the person, don't convince yourself. Uh, if trust is not there, then, uh, then you, you'd better move on. So being a business angel, obviously, uh, you actually, when you go to bed and you say, hey, I'm gonna be a business angel, uh, there are a number of reasons why you should be. Um, well, number one, what I see and what, is, what I see as, as a very uh, successful um, reason and a very uh, attractive reason to be a business angel is that you are actually call, you know, responding to a higher purpose. You actually meet somebody who is sharing the same passion as you do. They may be, you may see your young self in that person uh, and you are trying to help them with some money and with your connections and with your, with your credibility, with your authority. So that's one of the good reasons to become an angel. You can see many of the angels are actually, uh, you know, supporting uh, one or two generations younger uh, individuals. And that definitely, uh, that definitely means that they are, they are some, some, in some way uh, following the higher purpose. Now, the other reason is fun. You know, uh, clearly when you are actually already in the position that you don't really have to make ends meet and, and, uh, and, and use all the money that you make in a month, well, it's fun to actually provide resources to a, to a young company and see it flourish, see it grow. So it, it has to be fun. If it's not fun, don't do it because you are not going to like what you are seeing. Um, number three, uh, you know, Coming out of, let's say, a multinational context, uh, coming out of a, uh, a big corporate context, it's really, really refreshing. 
uh, to actually be dropped into a completely new era, new uh, uh, group of PM, a new segment, uh, into a group of new new people, and it actually can generate new connections. And who knows what you may go into a, a different business. Also, you are not a professional investor, right? You're an angel, so you may actually uh, find a different direction for your own career or for your for your own purposes. Um, number four, obviously, you can make some money. Clearly, uh, you know, as a business angel, you always have to make the you know you, the the math has to work out. The economics have to be there. So you can make some money. The reason why I don't say that you're going to be a billionaire is because it's not true. You're not going to be a billionaire. You're going to make some money if you do it well. Most probably in the first or the second one, first or second investment is going to be, let's say, a bit troubled. Uh, you may actually have to pay some, you know, some some dues. You have to pay for the learning. Uh, there is no better way to say it. You can learn from others' mistakes. You can learn from others' experiences. Um, so it's not necessarily true that you're not going to be very successful right out of the gate. Uh, out of the gate. But uh, typically, you know, your success comes along the way. Um, number five, uh, you can be up. You can stay up to date, or you can become up to date. Um, Many, many business angels that I meet, they, you know, I, I, when I meet them, they're like, well, wow, this is a new world. I didn't know that this is how the world is actually operating these days. So it's very, very refreshing to many, many uh, uh, business angels that they can actually look into uh, the dynamics of certain uh, industry segments that they've never seen uh, before. So there is a lot of good reasons to become a business angel. Uh, now, when they when they approach me, uh, they always say, "Hey, I found this startup. I want to invest in it." Well, uh, what is a startup? A startup. I'm not going to go into the definition. We are in Hungary. We never find a definition for anything. So, uh, I'm just saying it. Uh, in my book, uh, a startup is a group of people conquering the unknown. An operative word is unknown. You cannot actually open a bank and become a startup. No, because a bank knows what it's doing. Uh, you can become a startup when you are actually uh, di discovering the unknown, you are actually solving the problem. You are actually going after the unknown, and that's when you actually are going to you are going to unlock uh, a large market, uh, a significantly large market. Um, so look at this chart. Uh, this chart is basically showing you the four kinds of companies that you can invest in. Uh, Bottom line, I'm not, I don't want you to actually study the entire the entire chart. The bottom line is there are two kinds of start two kinds of companies that approach you. What is a startup, and more often it's a small business. There is nothing wrong with a small business, uh, but you have to be aware that a small business has the following attributes: it's limited by the owners and the founders' skills and options, and most importantly, I didn't put it there. I'm sorry about that. It's limited by the owner's time. When a company doesn't operate without the owner, that's called a small business in my book. It's very often geographically limited. It's tied to a particular location, maybe a, uh, maybe a city, maybe a country, but it's tied to a particular country. Um, very often, uh, they, they want to expand from one city to the other. That's, to me, that's not, a start, that's not a startup. That is way too slow uh, compared to startup growth. And the growth can be painful, meaning you have to partner up with someone, you cannot be everywhere, it's too expensive, you have to basically piggyback with someone, you have to buy a franchise from someone, that's not really a startup, that's a small business. What a startup is, is typically technology heavy, so there is a code, there is something that can be coded, uh, and something, a software or, a, or a, a software platform that operates even when the owner sleeps, that's a very kind of a funny way of saying it, but a technology startup grows every minute of the day and night. It's very, very fast. It can grow 100,000 by the hour. It's amazing, amazing growth speed. And that's why investors like it because there is literally no limit because technology uh, has a limitless growth potential. And last but not least, uh, a startup has a global audience and a global market. But I forgot to mention in the small business section, small business very often operates only in Hungarian or in the local language because there is no need to operate in any other language for them. For a startup, if they really want to make it in the world, they have to be in English from day one. Let's move on. What, can, what is the goal of a startup? The goal of a startup can be summed up in these four, in my book, in these four uh, um, statements. 
One, uh, they are interested in value creation. They are they want to create a value to the to to the uh, um, to the customer so that they are ready to shell out the money uh, um, uh, for the services and uh, and products that they provide. Number two, they are looking for the unfair advantage. They don't want to be fair. They don't want to be commensurable with uh, anybody on the on the uh, on the current marketplace. They don't want to be uh, the fair guy. They want to have the unfair advantage. A startup can do overnight what a corporate can do in six months. That's an unf unfair advantage, and it's a good unfair advantage because they are actually um, they are leveraging the only thing that they have is flexibility and unlimited growth potential. Uh, number three, growth should have been uh, number one. Growth, uh, growth is. Uh, is a very, very difficult question. Obviously people wrote books about it, you know, how, how to manage growth. One of the top reasons why startups fail is the too fast growth. I'm not gonna go there. In Hungary, we don't have that kind of problem uh, or, the, or for Hungarian startups, but growth is a major, major issue. Uh, I'm going to say something that a lot of startups don't like to hear. It doesn't, it, I'm not saying anything bad about that, but it, a lot of startups don't like to hear it. If your company doesn't grow when they launch the product or the service. If your company doesn't grow in the first month, you should shut down that product. If something works, it works right away. Uh, if it's not working, it's going to be a slow kind of zombie-like, you don't know if it's going up or down, it's going to be a very painful long process. So if you actually find something, if you found something, you know that you found it because the growth is going to be immediate and ongoing. And number four, maybe the most important uh, goal of a startup, they are looking for the exit. They're looking for either a sale, selling to a, um, a professional investor, selling to a financial investor, uh, or selling to a strategic investor, somebody in you know, a major fish in their, in their marketplace. Or they're looking for an IPO, an initial public offering, uh, when they get, basically they go to the stock exchange. There is, in the last three years, there is another way of going to the public, uh, which is through the uh, cryptocurrencies. I'm not going to go into details on them. It's just a possibility. Um, many startups uh, use that avenue also, but historically and, uh, and uh, conventionally, uh, a startup is always looking for an exit in the form of a sale or an IPO. That's the goal of a startup. Lifespan of a startup. I'm going to give you this, uh, uh, this nice chart. Uh, there is a lot of information on it. Uh, it's basically giving you these little round circles at the bottom. Um, I think I, I can't enlarge it, unfortunately, but uh, the bottom line is, and obviously I'm going to send this presentation to uh, everyone who's interested. It's basically showing the lifespan of, of a startup from the, from found, from the two founders time, um, when, when uncle, obviously when FFF uh, joins the company, when the first angel joins the company with 14.7% uh, on this example, and then going on and then uh, creating an option pool for the important uh, employees, uh, for the first employees, and then incorporating a VC in the capital structure. So you see that right after the family, the angel comes and right before the formal venture capital uh, the angel is sitting right there. So it's a kind of a, almost like a transmission between the family, family world and the professional world. Now, when the, when the venture capital comes in, uh, they take a huge buy, 33% out of the company. And at the end, when in this example, in this uh, fictitious example, uh, the company goes to the uh, stock exchange, then 30% of the company goes to the VC. Uh, 35 percent goes uh, 38 or 39 percent goes to the two founders and everyone else uh, the uncle the angel and uh, and the public gets uh, uh, you know a smaller uh, share of the company this is kind of um, uh, a symbolic or a, or a fictitious uh, uh, capital structure of a startup uh, that went that went public the most important message of this is the founders end up with about 38% in this example, typically one third um, is the best that they can get. Um, typically it's a lot less uh, what, they, what they get when the, when the company goes, goes in the IPO. Uh, once you get into this second section of the lifespan of a company, uh, it's very formal, it's very institutional. Uh, it's, um, it's a different game basically uh, the, in, in the big, and, and what a lot of founders, a lot of companies 
um, are not used to is that in each in each phase you have to play the game with a little bit different structure with a little bit different strategy. Um, the reason why I show this to you is to, is for you to see that when you add, when you um, uh, you are the first uh, non familiar um, um, source of uh, source of capital for the company with 16.7 percent and you end up with uh, nine and a half percent at the end that's called dilution that's because uh, every, you have to make room you and the founders and everyone else have to make room for the new money for the new investors who come behind you it may not be it may, it may not be this you know very clean uh, capital structure as you see here it can be very complicated but um, typically the, the the lifespan of a, of a startup is you know in in rounds of financing you know you are probably one uh, you know before the first round of financing that's where you are as an angel investor and then after that you know the series a it can go actually to series a b c d e all the way up to k uh, many many different rounds and in each round there is a less and less and less room for everyone else but the VCs or but the um, the other um, uh, uh, sources of capital, clearly everybody uh, you know wants to take their uh, their fair share for the risk that they are taking on pushing the company along. So the bottom line is is that um, uh, at the end uh, the two founders will end up with uh, thirty five percent maybe um, or thirty percent one third of the company. You just have to you have to do the math in every case. For the next five years, these people are not going to make fair fair market salary because they are, you know, obviously they are as founders, they are not going to be uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, re uh, remunerated. So they are not going to get the market value uh, for their for their expertise. They are going to take a, um, um, a pay cut in exchange for the equity appreciation that they that they want to experience uh, through this process. Everybody has to make their own, you know, calculation. Uh, for the next five years, they make a very, very, you know, uh, very modest, uh, modest revenue. Will they be compensated with the 17 and a half percent at the end? Uh, and obviously, it's not only a fair 17 and a half percent, depending on how the VCs structure their, uh, their investment, it may be a lot less, not only in terms of percentage, but in terms of uh, um, the, um, um, the, the payout order. So this is just something to keep in mind that you are not the last investor in, in, a, in a startup. Now, what's the difference between a good and not so not so good startup? So, when you're looking at uh, a startup, what to look for and what what I would say uh, uh, I would call a good uh, characteristic and what I would call a not so good characteristic in a startup. Sign of a good startup. Well, a startup that is building on competence and market understanding that's good, uh, and they are not build, building on the on an idea. Uh, the idea is something nice. It's a kind of a shiny object that everybody loves to talk about. But it's not the idea that it's going to execute itself. It's the team and the entrepreneur who is going to actually make it happen. So, build on. If, if the team or the entrepreneur that that uh, is uh, is asking for your uh, for an angel investment, they are demonstrating competence and market understanding. That's a very good sign. If they have passion, if they have the drive, as we say it in Hungarian, if they harap vasat, that means that they are actually going to go, you know, all the miles. Uh, for your uh, for the for the company, and they are going to uh, be, you know, fair. Uh, um, uh, they they are going to provide a fair use for the capital that you provide to them. Um, it's very important that the members, so the founding members, like and respect each other. Uh, obviously, we are all humans, so there, there may be some you know disagreements in certain things, but it's fundamental that they respect each other and they think that they are in the best company. So those are the other two or the other person is the best for this uh, for this particular uh, for this particular uh, business. Uh, it's good if they have good pedigree. Uh, good pedigree meaning you know they have good uh, either educational or or uh, uh, or experience uh, track. Um, something that uh, you can point to and you can expect that they know certain things about particular industries because uh, you know they have they demonstrate they have a demonstrated ability to work on the, in those industries most important probably most important of this list they have the abil ability to execute execution is the number one failure for a startup at least in this part of the world they just simply don't execute they keep planning and they don't do it. They don't execute. So, ability to execute is number one. And obviously, um, again, just to reiterate, um, 
And when a startup knows that the opportunity is the best source of an idea, well, then you are onto, a, on, on, onto something. Uh, sign of a not so good startup, um, what to avoid? Um, let's see. Um, if founders don't respect, respect each other, that's definitely a no-no. Uh, that's, that's going to, that team is going to dissolve before you say one, two, three. Um, if, if, a, if, a, if a startup only works if you pay them, that, as a, that, that has a very bad connotation that typically is something to stay away from. If they don't have skin in the game, either you know, money, time, or energy invested in the company, if they don't have that, there's no attachment. It's just another gig for them. Stay away from that. Um, if they are family members to each other, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, it's, it's a bad thing to do a family business, but as an, as an external person coming into that relationship, you know, if they are, you know, man and wife, if they are, you know, brothers or father and son, you know, family always comes number one. And then you as a new, new investor, you may come number two. I don't want you to come number two. So uh, when there are family members involved in the business, it's very, very tricky to say the least. Uh, they will always pick, uh, you know, a family before the business. So just keep in mind if, if you want to take that risk. Typically, it's not worth taking that risk. Um, uh, I put this slide in just so that you know that uh, when we talk about angel funding, you are not the only game in town. There are many other sources of capital that, uh, that is available for startups. Um, I'm not going to go into, into uh, every detail, but if you look at, this, look at this chart up there, crowdfunding, angel groups, equity crowdfunding, those are all, uh, by now, by today, these are, um, uh, these are formal uh, these, these are formal um, uh, means of, um, of, of gathering equity into someone's business. These are all available. And good news is, it's not only to them, but to you also. You can share, I will, I will talk about it later, but you can share some of the risk in, the, in your company by letting others in or, or, or simply sharing the investment uh, with others. Uh, equity crowdfunding is one of, the, uh, one of the inventions that allows you to, uh, to do this. Uh, through this uh, online online uh, platform that they are operating, uh, angel groups. Uh, that's uh, a Kyrex. It's, uh, it's that, that is a that is a uh, an angel angel group uh, formation. Eva can speak about um, that is also sort of sharing the risk and sharing information and, and formalizing uh, the uh, the sizing and the the assessment process uh, for for uh, for angels when they are looking at uh, startups. There are many such various um, um, new uh, investment vehicles and investment methods. Uh, some startups don't know about them. Um, I think it's always, for you as, a, as an investor, it's worth knowing what the competition is. Um, going back, um, why would, a, why would a, a startup look for an angel versus uh, an early stage VC? Uh, I'm sure that you heard that uh, there is, for example, high ventures in Budapest, in Hungary, as an early stage VC who provides um, uh, capital to uh, to startups, so why would uh, why would a startup prefer an angel? And uh, and here is a just a very short uh, list of uh, of some of the top reasons. Uh, in my view, and I think that most uh, most startups agree um, that uh, angels are a better fit with the early stage. Why? Because many of the many of the angels themselves uh, are or have recently been entrepreneurs. They, they know what it is to run a business. They know how to, how to assess execution capability. They're not only looking at an Excel sheet and making a, a very uh, analytical um, you know, decision about the investment, but they actually have a good sense whether you are going to be able to deliver results. Um, exit ex uh, the exit expectation uh, for, for uh, angels is only two or five X. Um, it may be a lot uh, for, a, for a startup anyways, but uh, compared to what VCs are looking for, which is um, uh, many, many, many more uh, multiples, uh, so angels have a lot fairer uh, ex exit expectations, at least in the, uh, in, in, that's what I've seen in the last 10 years. Um, angels br typically bring smart money. I've, I've really seen a, an, an angel who invested money in a company that they didn't understand. They want to understand it. They want to bring something, some other value to the table, some, something other than just money. So they are smart, which means that they either provide their network 
uh, they provide their expertise, their understanding of, of that particular uh, industry segment. And so they are there with, with that business acumen that many startups don't have uh, right away. Um, when, a, when an angel invests in a company, that means that that's basically a personal approval of the company. Uh, they basically say, yes, I'm taking on this company. This is something that I want to actually, um, I want to push forward. This is something that I support. That, that may mean a lot um, if the angel is, uh, is, an, is an authority, is a, is a uh, sort of a, a well-known figure in the, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, what almost without, without exception, what every startup always highlights why they like angels, angels more than early stage VC is the faster decision-making process. It's very simple. When you're an angel, you invest the money that is in your pocket. When you're a VC, very often you invest money that was in someone else's pocket a couple of years ago. Uh, they gave the money to the VC and now the VC is, is actually making professional, judgment, professional investment decisions how to invest that money. But from the, uh, uh, from the uh, startup's point of view, uh, the latter, the, the VC process is a lot more painful and a lot more, lot more tedious. So with, a, with an angel, uh, you get, to get from A to B very, very fast. Uh, angels are also very open to syndication. That's what I found, uh, which means syndication means to join, to join up with, uh, with someone else, to team up with other angels so that you know, they can share the uh, risk, they can share uh, the, uh, um, the investment ticket size so they can put together the, you know, more funds uh, uh, for those companies. And they actually can build on you know, three different networks of expertise instead of just one person's uh, network and expertise. Um, and you always know what you get. Um, it's very, very rare that an angel actually sells their position in the company right off the bat. Um, it takes a long, long time for them to actually uh, you know, um, uh, quit such a position. And um, unfortunately, I've seen many, many examples when uh, you know, Hungarian you know, early stage VC, they invest the money and two years later, uh, the, the startup sees that they actually can, they have to negotiate with someone else because employees, uh, you know, managers of the company were replaced by, by someone else, someone else. Well, that's not the case with a VC, with, with, with an angel. You always, uh, you know, have the, have the very personal connection uh, with the decision maker. What should be the right uh, relationship between you as an angel and the startup that you're working with? Number one, it's a trust-based business. You have to believe the, the idea, you have to believe the startup founder, the, you have to believe that that team is going to be able to uh, execute that particular plan that they are putting forth. Um, you have to clarify uh, what, in, in the angel startup relationship, you have to be very clear about what they can expect from you and what you can expect from them. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, how many times do you want to meet with them? Uh, going forward, every week, every month, every two weeks, every two months, do you want to hear from them, um, you know, over the internet in a, in the form of an email, a uh, kind of an investor newsletter, or do you want to talk to them? You want to listen to their, you know, narrative of what's going on. Uh, do they want, you know, additional funds, and they want you to work with work with them to bring in new funds? You have to actually be very clear about that. Uh, early on, clearly there will be new things coming up as as uh, as the uh, as the life of the startup moves on. But if if you make assumptions early on, uh, it can be rather painful. If you think that well, I thought that this is what my role is in the company, and they thought something else about your role, that can be uh, unnecessarily pain. Um, what you know, what is you know, the most fundamental uh, two pillars of the relationship is the money that you provide. The investment that you provide to the company and the network that you can bring to bear. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, is tip, it is very typical that the startup doesn't have as big of a network as you as an investor because you have you know, 10, 20, 30 years of experience in your particular industry. You may have a lot bigger network and a lot, a lot more authority in that network than somebody who is just starting out um, in that or in, an, or in another, in another um, industry segment. So, that's also something that can de define the relationship. Um, personal credibility, when, as I mentioned earlier, when you as an angel, you invest in XYZ startup, that means that you actually um, kind of have, have a, 
a, a, a credibility relationship between the, the two of you. You are, you are being represented by that company. It's very important. So would you be happy if that company stood up on the stage and said, uh, you know, and made that pitch that you just heard? Would you be proud of that? Would you would you say that that's something that I want, or uh, you would you would uh, you wouldn't want to disclose that you are actually supporting this company? That's that's something that has to be dealt with. Um, you have to be uh, realistic about your return expectations. Typically, three to five x is 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 I would say an average. Uh, of course, there are always you know exceptions to the rule. Uh, you know, we had uh, the first billion dollar exit for an angel in. Uh, in uh, in Israel uh, two years ago, that was the that was the first time in this part of the world that that happened. But the rule is that you're not going to make that kind of money three to five x on average in about three to five years. That's what I think. That's uh, that's what I hear uh, reasonable. Uh, and you're in the same boat. So um, once uh, once it gets in, gets on the front front page of Forbes, once it gets into the uh, uh, newspapers that you are supporting a company, you are in the same boat. Even if you actually, you know, depart with them, uh, people are going to associate you with that company for for uh, for a while. So be mindful of that. That uh, you know, whether it's something that you uh, that you want or something that you would uh, you would rather just uh, keep it confidential. Now, some smart smart tips uh, that. Um, um, you know, for some of you, uh, or, or for some uh, uh, some angels, it's uh, kind of uh, self-explanatory. Uh, for others, it was not. Um, as I found, it wasn't uh, that that uh, obvious. Number one, um, it's always better to work in groups and uh, form alliances with others than working alone. Um, typically, you know, if, if you're working uh, alone as a, as an angel, you will, you will find that you don't have time for everything. You don't have time for scouting. You don't have time for uh, for analysis. You don't have time to understand what they want and actually make the proper uh, due diligence on the teams. Uh, for this purpose, there are a number of uh, Hungarian and international uh, companies. Uh, Ebon is one. That's the European Business Angel Network. Uh, Kairetsu. I think that uh, I will ask uh, Eva to um, uh, to say a couple of words about them um, later on. Um, my other you know, favorite example is New York Angels, which is like 450 uh, New York City Angels uh, working together on a monthly basis, uh, constantly reviewing and recommending deals to each other, sharing uh, experiences, sharing opinions, and uh, obviously sharing deal flow. Because one of the, one of the key issues is everywhere, no matter where you go to angels or VCs, the deal flow is not, uh, is not what we would like. Uh, we would like to have better deals, but um, uh, or, or or easier deals, but uh, but that's not that's not the case. Maybe now after COVID, it's going to change a bit. And Nordic Angels, um, you know, to, to speak about some some European examples, Nordic Angels is also a, a one prime example of uh, good uh, alliance forming. And it's not only for it's not only in due diligence and research, but in investing also. Investing in syndication is uh, is a uh, is, is an invention of this uh, of this profession. When you invest together with other with other uh, angels. That you like to work with, that you want to meet with uh, in a board meeting later on. Uh, so something that uh, you know that you actually want to uh, extend your own personal network uh, through this through this method. So uh, investing in syndication, investing in 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 uh, um, in in these in these groups, in these uh, spontaneous groups, is also a, a very typical thing in this uh, in this profession. Uh, one, uh, some of the other other tip that I would say is that you don't necessarily have to invest in the equity of the company. Um, obviously, the goal is to participate in the equity, but um, if you if you actually think that there is more risk than you like in the company, then you can pick a loan over a straight equity investment. If you invest uh, invest in a loan. Um, in, in the form of a loan, then obviously in case of uh, um, uh, the company goes bust, uh, that you are, then you are going to be paid before uh, any other owner of the company. There is another um, um, investment uh, construct called um, a convertible note, which allows a bit of both ways. Um, uh, first, you, you invest it as if it was a loan, and uh, given certain trigger events and given a um, certain time frame that goes by, you can actually convert your loan into, into equity. 
it's a whole different, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big topic, but the point is that don't only think in terms of equity investment, direct and nothing else. You can actually, uh, you know, mix, uh, pick and mix, whether it's a loan or equity or a, or a, or a mix of those. Um, the ideal investment size is not one. Uh, and also not 25. The, the ideal investment portfolio size, what I've seen is uh, three to four for an individual. Uh, less than that uh, is going to, basically the way I would like to put it is that it's not gonna matter to you that much anymore after a time if it's only one or two companies that you work with. And if you work with five or five or more, then you're not gonna have time to do basically anything else. Uh, three to four is that is that ideal size that uh, you know in, in in a kind of a rotation basis. Sometimes you are going to deal with uh, company A uh, five times a week, and then you know then then it's going to uh, tame off, uh, taper off, and then uh, then another company is going to uh, be more intense in your in your portfolio. If it's a th it's a three or four companies, then you are going to actually learn the language, learn the lingo, uh, learn learn the terms, and and actually the way startups operate. And you you're not going to be totally overwhelmed uh, as uh, as people who uh, invest in more than five or or, or ten startups they, they they typically experience. And also, you know, with three to four startups, you you start to have some portfolio, some you know, uh, resemblance of a portfolio. So you start to see that there is a, there is a there is a good reason why you're investing in the fourth company. You actually start to think through all the experiences that you had with the first and the second and the third. So you are, it's, it's your own learning, learning curve also. Um, and something that we don't do very, very much uh, in, in this part of the world, communication and communication with other fellow angels. Uh, you may say, well, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to say, Imre, it's very difficult to find fellow angels. Well, not really. Uh, you know, there is uh, the Women Business Angels, uh, to name uh, one organization who is uh, who is uh, uh, exclusively for uh, business angels, and also there is uh, you know the Hungarian Business Angel Network. And then, if you go online on LinkedIn or on, on Facebook, you find many other uh, organizations who are focusing on angels, communication with them, sharing best practice, sharing concerns listening to trends, you know, what they think and what they say about the world, that can be very valuable. So uh, that's, uh, that's basically a free, free training course if you're actually in the, in the right context, in the right uh, environment. Um, well, that was, that was basically my, my, uh, my, my, my smart tips section. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want more info on these kind of topics, um, then uh, feel free to be, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to uh, the Global Traction Facebook page. Global Traction is the company that um, I'm uh, heading up and we are in, uh, in the business of uh, international business development for startups and also in, uh, in, in fundraising uh, 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 for startups these days. Um, if you want to actually um, um, send the question directly to me, you can do so via email or via Facebook Messenger. And uh, this was basically the, uh, the, the summary that I, that I put together for, you know, how, how, to think, um, how to think of the startup, the early stage company with the mind of, a, uh, uh, of an investor, of an early stage, early stage investor who is not a uh, professional in this, in this field. Uh, now the second half uh, of tonight's event is going to be uh, with these two uh, fine individuals, Eva Reyes. Uh, I will let her uh, do a bit of um, introduction of herself and uh, Peter Kadash. Uh, anybody who knows something about the uh, Budapest startup scene, they know that uh, you know Peter has uh, uh, really uh, a deep impact on uh, on the on the Budapest. Uh, and the Hungarian ecosystem uh, via a number of uh, pre uh, publications and uh, and tools that he developed and worked with, and I'll also let him um, do a bit of introduction of himself. But before we would do that, I know that uh, uh, Esther wants me to ask all of you now to turn on your video so that um, in this COVID era, uh, this is our selfie, right? This is our online virtual selfie that we can take. Uh, of this event. So uh, all of you who are still here, uh, all 20 of us, uh, please uh, turn on your, uh, on your video and I will ask Attila to, uh, to do his magic. Maybe I should uh, just stop sharing my screen and then we can have, um, uh, 
pause the share or stop the share. Yeah. So I stop the share and then we can have uh, potentially uh, a group picture. Uh, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, it's well, I, I, I see us. I see a, a stripe, um, probably 20, 25 people up on the top of my screen. Uh, and now, yeah, and here is a gallery view of, uh, of all of us. Uh, Attila, are you here? Yeah, I am. Yes, I'm here. Uh, can we ask uh, the rest of the team to switch on uh, their uh, video, please? Switch on the videos, please. Yeah. Yeah. David, Rico, Zoltan. Okay. They don't hear us. All right. Please smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not everybody can. That's fine. All right, so I guess this is the part when we say Vizi right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, gee. This is what we used to say. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat, Esther. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, what? Uh, so, there's a question from Rika. What's your position on angel investing in the current situation? Um, every day I have, um, I have a number of um, you know, emails and, uh, and LinkedIn uh, um, notification and, and queries. Um, what I see that the world is, is really um, full of a lot of opportunities. Um, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people are, are, are willing to sell assets and sell companies uh, at a discount, um, I haven't, I haven't done anything in the last thirty days. I haven't touched uh, any of these companies simply because I just don't know what's going to happen, and it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's beyond, uh, beyond what I can, I, I can, I can foresee. I'm as, as for myself, I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that um, things are going in the right direction. If you know, uh, if the numbers on the uh, on this epidemic are, are going in the same on, on are going on the trend that they are going now, um, by by the end of the summer, by early fall, I'm sure that we are going to have uh, some kind of um, um, medicine, some kind of uh, shot um, that that is going to stop uh, the the spread of this virus. Um, in terms of the economic, uh, again, in angel investing um, uh, from from that point of view. Uh, most of the opportunities that I see are not angel size. Most of the opportunities are bigger, a lot bigger, uh, that that uh, that are available. Um, small ones, probably. I mean, small companies that are angel size companies. Um, I think that uh, they are still trying to hold out. They don't have 150 employees or 1,000 employees. Uh, they don't have to, um, you know, sell an entire factory or entire uh, business operation um, in Central Eastern Europe. So th those are the kind of companies that are in in in, in irreversible trouble. Uh, that's what I see. Uh, there are um, there are a number of um, new companies uh, coming in. I, I've I've never seen or I haven't seen in the last two months. I've not, I haven't seen any healthcare related um, uh, investment proposals. Uh, Probably because I'm not involved in healthcare too much, and others who are, are, are I, I know that they uh, they are um, not only receiving uh, proposals, but they also uh, uh, review uh, a lot of opportunities from from other from from a lot of other other institutions. Uh, so, in short, I think that uh, um, in my book, um, things um, haven't changed uh, radically uh, because the small ones are holding out. Now, if we are switching over to uh, to the questions, I think that uh, I would like to invite Eva and uh, Peter to join in. And uh -huh. if yeah, if you guys would do me a favor and, and introduce yourself in a in a sentence or two, because you, you can do it much better than I can. Uh, let's start with Eva. She's uh, she's here with us from London. 
but obviously she uh, she has uh, uh, significant experience uh, not only in angel investing uh, from her uh, uh, California days, but also uh, she worked a lot um, in the startup ecosystem and in, in investing here in Budapest. Eva. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for the introduction Imre. Um, so yeah, welcome um, I'm from London uh, or in London. Um, so um, yeah, I'm based here right now. Uh, I'm a senior investment manager at Sky. Um, we have a startup investments and partnerships team, uh, which is basically like a corporate VC, but we also do commercial partnerships with startups um, there. Um, so it's quite an exciting space to be at the moment. Um, but before that, um, I um, wrote for another VC based in London called Episode One Ventures, which is an early stage tech focused um, uh, VC firm. And before that, uh, I spent a couple of years um, at Day One Capital as an investment manager uh, in Hungary. Again, an early stage um, investor focusing on the Central Eastern European region and focusing on tech investments mainly. Um, so that's basically my VC background. And way before that, I also wrote at the Budapest Stock Exchange. So uh, that was a different um, period of my life. Um, and as Imra mentioned, I spent one year in San Francisco um, due to a Fulbright scholarship. And there I was volunteering with Keretsu Forum. Um, I can share a little bit more about it if it's interesting. It's basically a global business angel network. Um, so I guess um, it's uh, right into the topic. Absolutely. Peter? Okay, so uh, I'm mainly, uh, I'm much rather an entrepreneur with uh, almost 30 years of experience than a VC. I, uh, I worked only seven years uh, as an investor. Uh, I invested into 15 startups, um, a total of $5 million. Uh, and um, and put try to put them into the U.S. market um, uh, to a formation called Traction Tribe with two of my uh, of my partners. Uh, but mainly, uh, I uh, I think I'm I'm an entrepreneur uh, and uh, and I have several ventures. I built up uh, several companies. I, I worked for ten years with uh, Mr. Shando Damian, um, who was sort of my mentor, uh, and I really really respected him, and uh, I'm very grateful to him. Uh, and uh, practically, this is it. Uh, my main field is digital and uh, digital marketing, uh, and this is what I'm doing right now. Great, thank you, guys. So obviously, the first question is is very self-explanatory. Let's say a startup comes to you. You guys are professional investors, or or um, you're advising companies at the professional level. What do you say to them when there is a when there is an angel in the uh, in the capital structure, and uh, what do you think is the best way to work with an angel for, for a startup? Shall I go first? Or yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Um, so I think um, for VCs and like mainly my experience is related to, to VCs and institutional investing. Um, I think it's very valuable to have an angel network around you. So kind of um, have those connections um, to angels because I think the best deal source is coming from um, from your network um, and in many cases from angels. So I see that there are like two ways, either you reach out to angels because you are looking for good investment opportunities and let's say, Currently, if I look for a startup in the cybersecurity space, I know the person who I want to contact, and then I know that they will provide me with a couple of interesting names and companies, and they can also provide me with the background. So I think that type of um, reference references from, um, from, from angels can be very, very valuable. And the other way around is um, obviously when an angel comes to us and say, look, I invested in this company. I think it's very relevant to you uh, because um, it's in your investment focus um, at your stage. And I think it's ready for, let's say, a seed, a series A, a series B investment. So I think those type of referrals can be very useful and uh, building those relationships can be very helpful along the way. Um, so. That's what I would say, first of all, um, that I would use um, these type of relationships for. But I think um, um, seeing an angel on the cap table, it really depends what that angel brings to the table. So if, um, if it's a well-known angel, which is, um, you know, like it can be a very 
uh, common case in, in London, for instance, um, there are very well known people who do angel investing. It's kind of a good reference already, but of course, as a VC fund, you want to do your due diligence, you want to do your homework. So you don't re just rely on an angel. You want to understand why they invested in the company, what they see in the company. Um, and you also want to understand the cap table. So one thing that I would say is a red flag if the cap table is already very messy because there are hundreds of angels on the cap table. So cap table is basically the ownership uh, structure of the company. So you really want to see why you, you know, as a startup, as a founder, um, took on that angel. Why do you have so many names on your cap table? And of course, if it's a syndicate um, or that type of investment, it does make sense. Um, but I think you have to be careful with that as a startup, uh, who you yeah, who you give access to um, and who you allow to your cap table. Um, so that's, that's just something to, to think about. And also as an angel, angel investor, just make sure you invest alongside the right people or, you know, like you don't mess up the cap table right away because that will cause a lot of trouble and VC, VCs have to fix that. Yeah, for me, if the, the question applies to me as well. So, uh, uh, it, having an angel is a sort of double double edged sword for me because if the angel is uh, a reputable angel uh, with a name with a, a significant investment uh, history then it's definitely a, a good sign uh, and uh, I, I wanted to dig deeper into the, that company and understand how they work together uh, why the angel invested etc so so it's definitely additional information and uh, uh, someone, I mean, I would, I would invest with no question if, if I saw a company uh, where, uh, for example, Ron Conway invested, you know, so a big name, a really big name, but, but it can be also, um, also a, a different uh, approach is that if, if the company could only get uh, an angel who's a sort of rookie angel or, you know, with no name, with, uh, or with no background, that would be a red flag, because uh, because those those uh, VCs who who are uh, working to, in the in the early stages, uh, they can they obviously work together with angels a lot, right? But um, but it's difficult to work with someone who doesn't really understand uh, uh, the later stages. And most of those angels who are investing uh, for the first time uh, or who doesn't have significant experience, uh, it's it's pretty hard to work with. So I would probably rather back off or be at least cautious uh, with a company like uh, like that. Um, so it's 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 a little bit mixed thing, like when my mother-in-law crashes with my new Ferrari. It's mixed feelings. Now, uh, you know, those of you, those of those of the uh, the participants and those uh, people who know me, I uh, they know that I'm I, I like to be very contrarian and I like to sort of look at the both sides of the coin. Um, do you guys think that in this day, this day and age, uh, ticket ticket sizes are a lot bigger? You know, it's a lot easier to get a significant amount of cash from investors. Is there still real room for angel investing in the Europe? Let's say just let's just stick with Europe in the European context. Eva, I think, I think there is. Um, so one thing that I already mentioned, why I think it's very valuable to, to have those types of networks in between or relationships in between angels and institutional investors, because that's just like how you get deal source, vice versa. And it also happened to us, for instance, at episode one, but even now at Sky, that if I see a company which I'm really excited about, because I think the team is great, the product is great, there is a market for it. But for us, and I hate to use the term too early because like we use it a lot, um, but what it means is that maybe you, we want to see um, an existing product because we want to do a trial with them, right? Or, or it's just not in our investment focus. So let's say at episode one, we invested in seed and series A stage. So we can't do a pre-seed investment, but we would love that company to kind of, you know, um, evolve. So then we might go to an angel and say, yes, um, you know, like this is a great company. We had to decline it and the, at the investment committee because there's no room for us at the moment. Um, but I think if you can do the investment right now, later on, it might be like a very good opportunity for us as well. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's a very valuable thing. Another thing that I would add that 
I see basically three types of angel investors. Um, so besides the capital, as um, both of you mentioned that, I think it's valuable to have an angel and I would go from a startup perspective or basically approach, um, you are probably looking for something as, as a founder. So let's say in um, the UK, there is um, there are business angel networks such as the 24 Haymarket, where you basically um, have um, business leaders from the FTSE 100 companies. And so you can use their basically industry knowledge, their industry insights, those types of connections. So if you have a health tech company or a fintech company, even if you're coming from that background, it's always useful to have someone, um, you know, who is well, basically uh, well established in that industry or vertical. And so you can build on those connections, build on that expertise. The second type is basically when you know that that angel is very well connected in the VC world. I saw that um, at day one as well, um, we had companies where, of course, I can't, um, I can't disclose those names, but they were very well known uh, angel investors. And we knew that, you know, with a Hungarian team, with a lot of ambition, that company wanted to go international. So that was very, very useful for them to have that angel there who then would open doors for further fundraising and financing. So if you can add that value, I think, you know, if you know the right people and Andres and Horowitz or other big names, that can be very valuable. And I would take on an angel like that, of course. Um, and the third type, which is very important, is um, basically ex-entrepreneurs. So at, for instance, episode one, um, there is uh, one of the, the managing partners is Simon Murdoch. He's very well known in London. Uh, he invested in companies like Zoopla, Lafion, Betfair, Fondual, so very big names. And he also had his own company. That's how he started book pages, which then he sold to Amazon. Um, of course, you want to work with a person who understands what, what it means to build a company, a venture, and um, what entrepreneurship means, because he can empathize or she can empathize with, with you, what you go through. Um, there are more like practical views that they can share. And, and probably they are very well connected within, within the, the VC ecosystem or you know, like the, the startup ecosystem, so they can give you good advice, they can good in, they can give you good introductions. So I think there are like these, these three types, the industrial um, kind of um, knowledge, um, um, the, the financing type of angel who can help you with introductions and the entrepreneurial uh, mindset type of, of angel. Mm -hmm. Peter? Yeah, just, just one quick addition, uh, because that pretty much covers uh, what I think about this topic, but um, I think an angel uh, always uh, have to be uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, I, I used to tell this story. Uh, I, I told you that I invested in the 15 startups and uh, six of them uh, was founded by, <clears throat> by entrepreneurs who, who had significant experience from, from five to 15 years. And the other nine was, uh, uh, was established by new kids uh, or first time entrepreneurs. Um, let's say enthusiastic people who just wanted to, you know, uh, found the problem, uh, try to solve it. Now the outcome, uh, and, and this, uh, this was almost nine years ago. So uh, the outcome was this, nine, nine of these uh, 15 startups failed uh, and uh, six of them is still alive. Can you guess which six is that? So all of those that was that was founded by by people who had significant experience, they somehow survived. But all of those uh, that was uh, uh, that was founded by by rookies, those one failed. So I think one of the the biggest things uh, an angel can bring to the table is entrepreneurial experience. Um, this is. This is a profession. I, I saw so many people uh, coming out from multinational uh, companies who thought that, okay, yeah, I, of course, I, I'm in business for 15 or 20 years. This is easy. This is uh, easy to do it my, for myself. And they failed miserably. Like they couldn't grow a team. They couldn't build anything. They just struggled themselves uh, for years. And uh, finally they, they either gave up or went back to a multinational company or something. So. Entrepreneurship is a business. I think every angel must have uh, uh, entrepreneurial experience. Otherwise, I mean, their money is just, there's plenty of money in the, in the world. Uh, it, it's on the streets. As Imra mentioned before, there are uh, really weird uh, institutional um, 
capital structures, especially in Hungary, like High Ventures or, or what's even bigger is uh, um, CHE, uh, which, is, which is a great fund, uh, but come on. I mean, they can be bought out. The, you, can, you can buy this company out if you want, which is a, which is a kind of uh, uh, big advantage that when you're an angel, you have to, you have to do something uh, really special to, to be the help of this company. Of your, uh, of your investment company. All right. Now uh, we we have uh, we received questions. So let me let me read out the one uh, by Esther. Um, and I'm I'm really curious what you guys think. What is the special role of Central European startups in the world? If, may I go first with this because I, yeah. it will be very short. Yeah, of course. Absolutely give it, nothing. Just give it to me. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Yeah, <laughs> a good. startup. A startup is by definition global. If it's global, it competes on the global market. So there is no such thing that Central European startup. There are only startups in the global ecosystem, the global world. Uh, so absolutely nothing, right, Imran? And, and I, I know yeah. I've known you for years. <laughs> you agree with well, me? Uh, Unfortunately, there is nothing special. So exactly, <laughs> it's just, yeah, nothing. Well, that's that's just our view, Eva. Yeah. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree. As like a, an entrepreneur, you probably need to think on a global scale. So you don't want to just think um, locally. But it's a good start. Um, but I think I still see a lot of startups even here or elsewhere where they have their talent pool. In those countries so it's still a case that you know there is good tech talent um unfortunately it's still cheaper or well it's, it depends how you who, how you look at it but of course um you know if you want to cut costs um, and you want to have a good talent pool then you will go to those countries and and you will work together and it's still the case but yeah i agree i have to say that you know there is great talent pool in the uk there is great talent pool in the the us israel so asia so it's it's really hard to like just pick, you know, yeah. why it's better than, than another. For sure. All right, let's move on. Next uh, question from Morek. Um, how often startups have interdisciplinary teams and how often they have people from the, from the same field with similar experience? I think often they don't have experience in business or knowledge about markets. Often they have ideas, but they don't understand the market. How startups are open on, on knowledge from business angels? Eva, do you want to take it first? Yeah, so I think, yeah, it might be true, but I see an, um, an improvement, or if I can use that term here, um, from many founders that I think the key thing is that you, you recognize um, that you are, you know, you, you don't know everything. So you need to hire the right people for the right um, roles. And, and so they will fill in those gaps. Um, but I think I want to see a founder team who still understand their market because if they don't understand their market that's a huge issue you don't want to hire people who better i mean you want to hire people who can help you with that but i think you have to have more understanding of why what's your vision um about that market and the product uh, how you want to get, get there um who you want to hire um how you want to grow so i think um you need to have a basic understanding of the business um as a founder or as a founder team but I do agree that uh, a business angel can also help you with that. So if they, as, as we mentioned, if they are ex-entrepreneurs, basically they can help you with like how to overcome different hurdles, um, you know, who to talk to maybe, because sometimes it's just like, you need to talk to different people, different founders who went through the same thing, um, the same obstacles. So you can share uh, notes and you can kind of share views on different difficult situations or how to build a team, how to build a carter, how to build an organization, um, how to build a business plan. So there are all those bits and pieces. And that's why I think, um, so from an angel that can be a very useful input, also if they can introduce you to the right people. And I think that's why it's also very useful if, um, you know, an institutional investor organizes events where they try to connect different, um, like, CEOs, CTOs, um, so then you can build up that kind of knowledge, um, CFOs, of course, we talk about business, but I don't think that I would invest in a company where I don't see any 
knowledge from the founders on the market, on the market potential, on the scalability, on the vision. So I want to see that even if they are not, not an expert, but then, you know, um, they still understand why they are doing what they are doing. Yeah, I think yeah. Mar Mark raised a, a very important question, and this is something what we, we see uh, very, uh, very often uh, in Central Europe. Uh, we even have a term for it. Uh, it's called product heavy startups. Um, and for me as a digital marketer, or someone spend with a, a digital marketing focus, it's always amazing. I see companies uh, coming to my, I have an agency, an online marketing agency specialized in B2B. And I, I often see companies uh, coming to us with, uh, with quotes like, hey, we raised like $2 million and we spent it on the product and now it's ready. Someone should sell it. And I say, yeah, why not? How, am I, how much money do you have um, uh, still on your bank account? I mean, for marketing, for business development, for things like that. And they say, yeah, we pretty much spent everything on, on the product. And I can't resist laughing. Like, <laughs> this is crazy. This is, uh, this is uh, what I call a, a product heavy startup and, uh, or a product heavy company. And we see this very, very often. And yeah. don't invest in companies like this. Yeah, let me let me just add to this uh, to this part. Uh, you know how how startups are open to this uh, knowledge from business angels, or in other words, how do startups uh, actually handle uh, lack of information or or um, lack of understanding market? Well, the good thing is that Darwin's rules are still valid. So um, those startups who just simply don't want don't understand the marketplace. Uh, don't understand the market. They don't know what the what uh, what product is uh, is uh, is uh, required by the market. Then they are going to go belly up. And actually, that's I think that's one of the uh, one of the advantages of the current uh, trying times. That those companies who live on grants and on uh, and on uh, sort of uh, um, uh, bad bad investment decisions. Let me put it that way. Uh, who are just basically buying time, you know, every year they go back to the same source asking for more and more money, they never face the market. Uh, so uh, an environment like this is not helpful, but an environment where um, the companies have to face the market, they have to face the music, uh, they necessarily navigate towards experience and expertise and, and real information about the market. They don't, they don't want to cloud their own vision uh, with uh, you know, with um, you know, over researching things. Now, um, another question from Barbara: Startups usually fail because of human issues, team leadership. Is there a way to assess the human potential of a team? Now, let me let me start this. Uh, I'm going to be short. I promise. Um, I think that uh, um, there is there is this saying in investment circles uh, when they sit down with a startup: Have you failed before? And if they fail before, then it's like, okay, we can continue talking because failure is such a drastic, bad experience for us, for an entrepreneur. It means that, you know, in a, like, in a almost like in a marriage counseling, have you, have you been through a breakup before? No. Well, then I don't want to deal with you. So it's like, well, you, you've never been through uh, any kind of conflict within a team because in typically failure is a conflict within a team. Then, then you are not probably a, a good, a good partner to uh, uh, to speak with. So, in my book, in my book, it's very important that the that the startup who comes to me or or, or, or asks for collaboration or whatever, that they've been through hard times or they come from very very uh, poor or um, um, resourceless backgrounds. So they actually learn to live on the back of ice, as we put it in Hungarian. Uh, that means that they actually have that kind of uh, human potential that keeps them together. It's not only the, the paycheck at the end of the month that keeps them together, but the, but the uh, experience that they can actually produce results, they can actually pull for each other. Eva? Yeah, so it's very, it's very funny actually how I see it because um, coming from Hungary, of course, where there's no culture of failure, or I think, well, there's like a, a, we are getting there, but I think it's still not accepted if you fail. I thought like, oh, wow, the UK is much more embracing with, the, you know, the cultural failure, uh, but they compare themselves to the US, which is even more embracing with that. So I think there are different levels of accepting failure, but I agree um, as a startup founder, you will come across 
a lot of obstacles on the way. There is no such a way that you just, you know, it's like a very clear path to the success. So um, I would recommend to read, for instance, Ben Horowitz's book, um, The Heart thing about hard things where he basically describes um, how he built his own venture, what kind of failures he went through and then how he now like as a, a basically a VC investor um, what kind of recommendations he, he has. Um, so yes to failure I think um, is a component but how we assess um, you know the team what I can say, these are kind of cliches, but this is, this is true. So the more you see, the more patterns you will recognize, um, the more questions you'll have to the founders and to the team. And I would add here, you don't just want to get to know the founders, you want to actually meet the team. Because at the very beginning, it's typically not a lot of people. So for instance, when we invested in AI Motive at day one, I remember that I went to see the team, I talked to the developers, I talked to different people, because I really wanted to understand who does what, how they work together, what the culture is like. Um, so I think that's a very important element as well. And besides the, the business meetings that, that you have, the negotiations, you also want to take them for a drink or like get outside of the office and basically just get to know like their you know their mindset and the way they they think about things um and i think currently there is a lot of talking about for instance mental health are you prepared for this journey like do you know what it means to be an entrepreneur um and i think a lot of people don't or they think they do they think they're prepared but then at the end of the day when they get there they you know it's really hard to overcome those situations so i think mental health is also that is, is very important um, and yeah those types of um, you know outside the office talks um, are also very important and and negotiation is a very interesting one as well so when we negotiate terms with the with the founders that's where I can also see like are they challenging me as an investor or they just agree on everything that I say because that's not a good sign so there are these little things which you can kind of um, kind of see and um, and also like the questions they ask from you um, and whether they are also interested in who their investor will be. I think that's a very interesting thing because very important thing because you want, uh, want them to kind of have the chemistry in between you because you'll live together for years, hopefully. Yeah, uh, let me have a, a thought for this kind of culture of failure because that became super uh, famous in the past few years. Uh, as Eva mentioned, uh, if, if a company, uh, if an entrepreneur didn't fail, then uh, he's not a real entrepreneur. And, and that, this is, this is hugely misinterpreted in, in my view. So failing doesn't mean that uh, an entrepreneur must burn all the money of, of his investors and bankrupt the company. This is, this is not failing. This is just a, a, this is just crazy thing. I mean, this is not the, not the kind of goal that anyone wants. Failing, I mean, the, the culture of failing means that someone can fail very fast and in very small steps from a very little money. So I'm, uh, as an entrepreneur, I fail like every month, uh, a couple of times, but this doesn't necessarily mean that I, I back up my company because I can fail in three days out of $400. But in the meantime, I'm making like tens of thousands of dollars every day uh, or every, every week because, uh, because that's just uh, how it's, it goes. And uh, what Ima mentioned is that those people who are, uh, who are able to, to live on ice in the Arctic, uh, those are not the people who fail. Those are the people who, who can make money even if they are failing in some fields. And this is a very big difference. So failing doesn't mean that, that look for those people who bankrupted companies. I mean, this is crazy. Don't do that. I mean, those people who bankrupted companies, those are not, these are just not, the right people for you to invest. Uh, look for those people who can fail almost invisibly, uh, but meanwhile they can they can make money themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess failing should be interpreted as uh, admitting negative result. It's not that's not necessarily yes. being a bad manager. Yes, admit that well, it, it didn't work, and how you handle that and how you move on. That's uh, that's what that's what happens in every venture, almost every month, every every quarter. Something doesn't work out. Yeah, in the in the US, it, it it's uh, already kind of um, uh, kind of a cliche that a startup doesn't make money. Uh, you have to pump uh, the, uh, the investors' money into a startup, and it's not making money. This is not true. I know a lot of companies that are making money out of the box. 
and who made money even without the product. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is what makes a good team. They are making money. I mean, come on, you are investing your money into this, this, uh, uh, of that company. You want to see a return sooner or later. Of course, this is a long-term game and most of the companies fail and uh, the other companies have to go a, a long way and have other rounds of investment. That's right. But sooner or later, you want to see money on the table, right? This is why we, do, we are doing it. This is why entrepreneurs are doing it. Yeah, what you what you uh, what you said, Peter, reminds me of uh, uh, a meeting with an entrepreneur, and he said, and I said, uh, so when when can I see the uh, the product? So when you know when do you have a demo? And he says, we are working on the MVP. I'm like, when did you start working on the MVP? Four months ago. Well, <laughs> M stands for minimum. <laughs> minimum. Yeah. Minimum. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, it's it's crazy. And actually, Eric Ries, who invented the term uh, minimal viable product, MVP. Uh, he actually now says in his book that uh, he, he should have called it MVE, minimum viable experiment. It doesn't have to be a product. It can be just an experiment, whether Definitely. it very proper works. Definitely. Now, moving on, next question from uh, uh, Renata. Uh, in your opinion, how many angels fit well into a syndicate? What happens if and when the angels disagree on the way forward with a startup? Beautiful question, Eva. Well, it's, um, I think it's hard to, hard to answer the question in terms of, you know, there are different types of syndicates. So you can, as Imre, you mentioned in your presentation, um, you can start with a crowd, crowdfunding platform where you can basically invest 10 pounds in, in a company like Cedars or a Crowdcube. And so we'll, you will be part of a big syndicate, but there is a lead who will then basically negotiate the terms, negotiate the price, but you have to, I mean, in that case, you have to accept those terms that you sign up for. So you don't have much say in that. Um, then there are those types of syndicates where, yeah, there are like a couple of um, angel investors. Um, but again, I think it's very, it's very important that you trust each other um, and there's a lead who will then go on with the negotiations and so you have the basic terms um, and how you like what you know what you want to achieve with that investment and then if you go on uh, go into the company as an individual angel investor you I think have to be prepared of maybe doing all the work yourself if you know there's no institutional investor alongside so you have to do your due diligence whatever it is it might be very light it might might be like very thorough it depends on you and by my mean i i by by that i mean um you want to understand the market you want to understand the product um the potential the exit strategy so there are so many things you want to understand or you just deploy capital and you are comfortable with that um and one thing that you definitely have to think about, so I think these are the different levels of so crowdfunding, syndicate, and an individual uh, angel investment, um, um, is um, that you know there will be probably other financing rounds where VC firms will come in and so they will take over. So they will have uh, preferred rights. Um, and so you won't have much say in that company. Um, you probably won't have veto rights and voting rights and all those things that institutional investors will have. Um, so you have to accept that. You might have, you know, perhaps a stake in further investments, but you can't play, you know, uh, the game um, up until very late stages, probably. Um, so you have to be comfortable with that. You also have to be comfortable with, you might be bought out as an angel uh, later on uh, by a secondary transaction, because as like big, you know, the big fish comes in, um, they might just want to fix the cap table, clean the cap table, and they will buy you out. So I think there are different things to think about. I don't know the optimal number for the number of angels to go in but I think you have to get the numbers right. And what Imre was showing on that chart with the Empire State Building, you don't wanna mess up the cap table. So you wanna make sure that at a very early stage, you don't take much up from, um, from the founder's equity because then later on, no further investor wants to come in. Yeah, one, one more thing. Uh, there's, uh, there's no optimal number, uh, absolutely, because uh, if there are just two angel investors and are, if the contract is bad, uh, then the, the whole thing will mess up uh, and you can have like 20, 40, no matter how many, uh, if the, if the contract is right, then, uh, those angel investors have to decide whether to go, go forward, uh, or not. And, uh, this will, uh, hugely affect their uh, ability to vote or to, you know, influence the company 
uh, from a board level, and that's called pay to play, uh, which is in, in practically every contract, every group contract. So if they, uh, one of the angels or, or many of the angels decide not to go forward, they will, they will dilute down and they will have no voting rights, no, uh, uh, no uh, substitutional rights, nothing. So there is no such thing that uh, a, an evil investor or, uh, or a founder in, uh, doing things in bad faith, no such thing like that. There are only bad contracts. Do the contract right and uh, everything will be fine. Mess up the contract uh, and uh, the whole thing will, will go down the toilet sooner or later. Yeah, uh, one, more, one more thing I would like to add. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's very good in a, in a kind of a symbolic way. Also, the, the, way the, the way the question was formulated, what happens if the angels disagree in the way forward with the startup? Well, um, it's up to the entrepreneur uh, how the startup is going, because it's at the end of the day, it's the entrepreneurs and the founder team's company. Totally. And I always, what? Yeah, totally. You're totally right. Uh, I, I often I often correct investors in Hungary when they say, "Well, I have 25 startups. I have, you know, I, you know, we have these startups and that's no, no, no. You're an investor of those startups. It's not an ownership necessarily. It's not that you determine what they they are going to do. And I think that that uh, um, clearly, as as the as the question also indicates, there is a sense of that, but that is hurting the entrepreneurs. Uh, mindset also that it's their business and let them do what they do and the angels do what they like to do and and investors do the do, do their thing so it's uh it, it's it's very important that uh the angels sign on knowing that the, that's the entrepreneur that's how they are doing things i've uh i work with uh three entrepreneurs uh when i when i talk about investors they say they have to go they don't want they don't want to talk about the investors because they know what they are in, in for. So they say, no, 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 we are going solo. 100% ownership. They're doing really well. It can be done. It is done every day. They are just not in the news because they are busy working. So, uh, but that's, uh, that, I'm, I'm talking about obviously big institutional investors, not, uh, not, 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 uh, not saying no to the angels. Uh, Marek also has a question about uh, Dubai. How many startups are active in Dubai taking part in cohort and other contests? Um, how cooperation between startup ecosystems from Hungary and the Arab, Arab Emirates look like? Uh, I understand the question. I'm I'm not sure if, if this is the right place to talk about it. I can I can um, I can continue talking about it with Marek, uh, with you, Marek, if uh, if you want, because I'm I'm also active with uh, with some uh, startup ecosystems. I don't know if Eva or or Peter, you want to add something to that. Hungarian startups in Dubai. Not really. It's a smaller ecosystem, and uh, I think uh, Dubai and uh, uh, generally the, the Middle East is very interesting as a market. Uh, but there are special rules uh, there, so uh, as an ecosystem, it's not yet there. Yeah, Eva. Well, I don't. I'm not really familiar with, to be honest, with the Dubai Hungarian ecosystem. So I don't want to say things that are All not right. valid. Okay, so uh, Marek, if you want, like we we can we can continue. Uh, thanks, Eva, for mentioning crowdfunding. Uh, Took a portal, the first Hungarian crowdfunding equity portal is just being started. Uh, what do we think of um, a local crowdfunding portal? What What is your take on that? Uh, there, are, there were numerous attempts before in the history in this country, in other small European countries. Um, do you think that uh, that a strong local uh, crowdfunding uh, portal is uh, is a viable option? Is it something that uh, Startups should look into and uh, and how how could uh, you know angels uh, participate? It's one of the channels, I guess, to uh, to have access to equity. But uh, what's your take on that local equity portal? Eva, you want to go first? Um, yeah, very briefly. I think um, because I'm not an expert on crowdfunding, uh, obviously, like I. I'm familiar with that, but um, I'm not working with crowdfunding platforms. Um, I do see the value in them because obviously it gives financing and it gives access to investors, even like, you know, smaller investors, if they want to basically um, diversify their savings or portfolio into companies and they are excited about certain companies. So I think that's a great thing. And also from a startup side, you can, of course, um, you can, of course, uh, build um traction as well you can also use it for marketing purposes and meanwhile you also get some financing um, but i think it's really i think 
on, in terms of a local crowdfunding platform, obviously it's about the demand side and supply side. So can you build both? So will you have enough, enough interesting startups that you can kind of showcase to the, the local audience or like not just local, but global audience, but is it something that would attract, um, you know, investors? And on the other side, the chicken egg problem, of course, do you have enough investors who are interested in those uh, in those startups? So I would say it's very similar to the marketplace issue that you need to build those basically volumes on both sides. And once you have that, I think definitely it can be very useful for certain purposes. Um, as I said, it gives visibility um, and it also gives access to smaller investors. Yeah, um, uh, it's called uh, crowd funding platform which means that it needs a crowd so why the heck do you want to limit it to to a local community then it can be global i i just don't get the business idea mm -hmm. but maybe uh maybe this maybe the problems those startups solve are local and only locals would understand that there may be um, a rationale behind that but that again limits its uh, growth and uh, its size yeah, totally. I mean, as a business, uh, I would be very much worried about um, anything like that. So, uh, limiting this uh, to uh, to a local market, uh, it's just not it's just not won't pay out in the long term because any of the big, uh, large cloud crowdfunding uh, platforms can uh, can localize very easily, and uh, they have you know more reach, uh, better brand, uh, more experience. So. I, I don't understand why uh, why it matters. Uh, very honestly, I mean, it's such a small country. Uh, you, you can you can reach everyone uh, uh, in uh, two or three connections. So I just don't get it. Why why would it work? But good luck for them. Yeah. All right. Um, for now, we are at the end of our question list. Uh, so anyone anyone still having some burning issues in there in your mind, please. Uh, send send in your questions, your comments. Um, okay, any questions about how to invest, what not to do, what to do, how to pick the right companies, how to make a deal flow, and just trying to pick through your mind. Uh, one, thing, one thing that that uh, that we keep we keep um, uh, receiving questions: Where can you find good startups, good investment targets? Because Typically, for a for an uh, an average uh, for a uh, for a typical um, a private individual, they don't knock on their door. Where can where can these companies be found? Yeah, may I go first, Steve, or you want? Of course, no, go first, please. Uh, okay, so this is the million dollar question, because and uh, one step before that. So we all know that uh, deal flow is a pyramid. Uh, it's a kind of cliche. Uh, you can only make money uh, from the top of the deal flow. So here's the question. Let's say uh, you want to invest um, $1 million uh, into 10 startups, uh, 100K each, in the following, let's say, three years. After a year, uh, the first really interesting venture uh, comes in your way after hearing out like uh, uh, 12 or a dozen, uh, two dozen trash companies. The first one that, that's really interesting, how will you know that it's the top of the deal flow or it's just uh, a pretty good company. And uh, the next week, there's going to be a much better one and a much better one and, and so on. So the answer is you won't know. Uh, they, they obviously won't introduce themselves uh, as, uh, hey, we are at the top of the deal flow. So um, what you have to do is to, to screen as much companies as you can, as fast as you can. And uh, I think this is the key uh, to find the right companies. Uh, and not not investing too early, uh, too early on. I mean, not you know, not rushing into investing in companies, but also not delaying it too much. Uh, I know a lot of investors investors who uh, who are doing this for five years that haven't invested into one company. This is you know, this is a red flag. Uh, and this brings us uh, another thing. Uh, you have to work on your own reputation as a uh, as a uh, an investor, an angel investor. If you don't have investments, uh, a, a certain amount of time later, uh, you won't be able to, to uh, attract any companies at all. But if you invest your money too early, uh, you probably uh, uh, you, you will miss the, the top of the deal flow. So you have to you know, be very, very much balanced and, uh, and look 
things that way uh, and also work on your personal reputation. Eva? Yeah, so um, to add to that, I think um, if you want to become an angel investor or any type of investor, I think you have to have a very open mind and you have to have the willingness to basically um, you know, engage with different startups, go to different events, talk to different people. So you have to build up that mindset. And if you don't have that, I wouldn't recommend investing into you. So I think as an investor, I'm curious about the stories of different companies, those people, why they are building that product, um, you know, in my current role, like why it can be relevant to Sky and what we do, how we could do a partnership with them. So like there are different types of um, motivations that an investor can have, but you have to be passionate about um, investing. So that's very important. And I think um, you just have to mingle, go to the right events. And, you know, when I started my career, I went to all the all the events that were available in Hungary um, and um, and in the region and then I started to feel like okay, I know this is worth going to this is not worth going to so like you have to have a short list of events that you know that they are very valuable um, or you know, deal sources uh, you might find some interesting companies there and um, because I haven't talked about Keretsu Forum yet and it's been a long time that I you know I was with them so I don't really know if anything has changed just as a disclaimer but um if you are a member of that you know a community like that so basically it was um based on membership that you could become a member of which was a global she's still a global um business angel network then you will get access to pitches you'll get to know other investors um so you will build your network through that um you also i think it's worth going to events at the beginning and maybe just listening to other investors their questions like why and just think about like why are they asking those questions and you can learn from them you can pick up those little bits from you know different um investors or even founders asking each other um and so at Keretsu forum they had uh pitches and then um the the angel investors could indicate whether they're interested in the company and so there there's basically a formal process when um the members themselves did the due diligence process uh, for you know for for that specific company or investment case, um, and and basically they negotiated the terms uh, amongst themselves, um, the, the investors who were interested in that company, and then they went back to the company, did the due diligence, negotiated the term sheet, and so basically the whole process was facilitated there. So it might be useful if you just start off um, as like a newbie that you try to pick up those little bits from, from others, um, go to as many events as possible. I would also recommend if you have the opportunity and I know in the current situation, we don't know when it will be again, but now there are so many online events available, fantastic events, for instance, in London, COGEX, which is an AI, focused conference will be now available for free or at least certain talks like just you know try to build up that like knowledge uh, listen to to different um stakeholders and i think it will come to you and you you'll eventually know where to go to to get a, a good source mm -hmm. um let me just let me just add something because um i had more time to uh, to think about this uh, question that i asked <laughs> um where would you look for uh, um, startups? In my experience, uh, what really works is going to people with authority, people that I respect in, in IT, in engineering, in business development, whoever. I just ask them a simple question. Who do you think is good? And they will necessarily respond because they are knowledgeable. And two, they will say something that they really mean. Um, so if you, if you have that kind of a network, uh, you are going to get a good, pretty good pipeline of people who you are, uh, who you could work with as an entrepreneur or as a company. Uh, Nadia, um, uh, that's that that seems to work um, in uh, in most cases. Um, I definitely um, I definitely advise you to go to good companies and talk to them. Just sim just human human to human relationship for no particular reason and just talking to them. Uh, it actually uh, opens up a lot of a uh, lot of good good uh, good avenues. Uh, I'm, uh, just a bit of bit of um, um, I wouldn't no, no it's not necessarily self promotion. I'm just proud. Um, I, I was informed two days ago that um, 
that uh, one of my early attempts at, um, at helping others create a company in 2013, I had two individuals who, uh, who seemingly didn't like each other or had nothing to do with each other. And I invited them to Starbucks and I seated them with each other. And I said, you have to work together because you guys will like each other in the long run. They just sold the company two days ago. Um, and it's a good thing. I mean, not selling it in the, in the bad way, but uh, in, in, a, in, a huge, in, a huge, uh, in a huge exit. Uh, and just making these connections, it's, it's going to take a while. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention, if, if, you, if somebody is, is kind of uncertain about being an angel, I think it's always a good path to become first a mentor. And as a mentor, see how the company works from the inside, work with multiple companies as a mentor. You start to learn the way those companies think, whether they are trustworthy, uh, whether they actually do what they say they do. And in the long run, you develop that kind of a connection, kind of a connection that you are not only a mentor, but you can mentor being bringing the smarts, but uh, mentor uh, bringing, uh, bringing some of the money and become an angel investor. That's also a path. Next question that we, uh, we received uh, from somewhere, I'm not sure where, uh, what's the most essential point in an angel investment contract with a startup? What would you never miss from the contract? How long do you evaluate a startup before investment? Let me begin, with, begin this with an anecdote. Uh, one of the uh, famous angels in Budapest, uh, eight years ago, invested in a startup. Um, and he invested, I think, about $100,000 at the time. And uh, the negotiation was very, very long. Uh, they couldn't agree on one thing, veto rights. Veto rights for the angel, whether the company could change course of business. And he said, no, 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 I don't want you to change the business. I want you to stay in social media. Social media was the thing then. And they said, no, 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 but you know, we really want to have freedom in our operations. Long story short, he agreed that they can have uh, freedom in their operations. Two weeks later, they sent him a postcard from, uh, from the beach in Spain uh, that now they, they actually changed the business into uh, renting sailboats uh, because that's what they like. And that's what the contract uh, allowed them to do. Uh, so for that particular angel, I'm sure that um, uh, changing business or a course of business is definitely going to be a, a key issue. What do you think, Peter? What would be a key essential element for, a, for an angel? In a, a, a couple of things. Uh, and this is, this is really the, uh, the core and, or the heart of the, the angel investing. Uh, because you know it's so uh, there's so little time uh, to to do this right, and the, the horizon of the company is so big that you practically have to to uh, see forward uh, to you know years. Um, so so this is difficult. Uh, one of the key things is pay to play uh, to ensure uh, the later stage investors that you won't be uh, uh, an obstacle uh, in that company's uh, uh, history unless you pay for it. So the, the right angel investment uh, mindset, I think, is uh, and the, uh, the same applies for uh, early stage investors, whether it's institutional or personal. Um, the right mindset is to, uh, to limit yourself to, to a reasonable uh, amount of control in the company. Um, so, so first of all, pay to play. Also, uh, protecting yourself is liquidation preference. It's very important. I'm not talking about the, the pretty uh, obvious rights like the tag along, drag along, wh whatever, because there are so many outcomes when you invest into a, uh, uh, an early stage company. Like Ibra just said, the company can change the course or the company can bankrupt very quickly, or the founders can uh, you know, have a huge fight. One of them leaves, takes the half of the product. There's gonna be a, a lawsuit, whatever. There are so many outcomes that you practically are you won't be able to, to prepare to, to each of them. So uh, the right mindset is to pick those ones that's really interesting for you. Like when the company uh, bankrupts, uh, you, you, you have no interest in the company. Your, uh, uh, your money is flushed on the toilet, whatever. So uh, <clears throat> you have to prepare to those outcomes that, uh, that brings you money. And I had uh, an investment into Consignia with my partners. Uh, we, we put in $130,000 very early and uh, I think we made a great mistake. We, we didn't, uh, two mistakes actually, two uh, huge mistakes. One of them was not, uh, not wanting a, a voting right back then. And the second one is not, not 
uh, following on with the second investment. Uh, but we could do it. We, we still had money, but we thought it's, this is probably not our field or not, not our, you know, uh, this is a, a different uh, thing, uh, different playground. And we didn't invest, we didn't make the, a follow on, uh, on investment. We still have share in the company. The company was valued more than hundred million dollars. It's awesome, uh, but but we could have we could have more, much more than that. And I really recommend you uh, uh, reading the story from uh, from Ben Horowitz uh, about uh, investing into Instagram. That's a very good story. So just just Google it, Ben Horowitz uh, Instagram. He has a blog post, and it's really really valuable to all investors. Yeah, so I... Did I answer your question, Ira? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Over to Eva. Yeah. It was a lag. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so I think um, it might sound sarcastic or whatever, but I don't mean it like that. But if it's a successful startup and they will grow fast, they will probably need institutional investors to come in. So as an angel, you will be probably overruled by many institutional investors and you won't have much say, as I said. So you have to accept it as an angel investor. And it can be really good for you if you if you know if you, that company gets the right investors on their cap table, they will know what they do and hopefully you know, the company will know what they do and they will build the company. And so no one has to intervene. But just to bear that in mind, in terms of voting rights, veto rights, all those protections, those probably will be overruled by the, you know, by the institutional investors. And it's also true for early stage investors, institutional investors, you know, as the, the later investors, later stage investors come in, they will lose many of those rights. So you just have to accept that fact. I think one of the key things that I would definitely ask for is preemptive rights. So you want to have a pro rata, at least opportunity to, to invest pro rata in the company. Um, because if you think that they are doing well, they are meeting their milestones, um, you probably want to kind of at least maintain your ownership stake in the company um, because it's a growing pie and you want to, you know, you want to be part of that pie and you don't want to be diluted to a very small percentage. So if you can get that right, I think that's a good thing. And it's also a good signal to you know, incoming investors, institutional investor that, oh, the angel investor wants still wants to invest in this company. So that means something good because they still believe in this company. So that can be a good signal as well. Um, I'm not so familiar with like angel, um, of course, uh, term sheets or terms, because obviously I'm more on the institutional side, but I think if you can get some type of information, right? So at least you get, you know, updates from the company, what's going on. You don't really want to take over uh, hopefully, because that's not the right setup. But you, you know, you want to get informed what's going on with the company if there is, you know, any issue. Uh, because I think to build a trust in between the angel investor and uh, the founders uh, or the management team is crucial. Because then you can talk through difficult things, um, difficult situations. Um, so I think that type of trust is more important for me than putting a lot of, um, you know, like um, institutional investor type of of terms. Um, but, but definitely get some protections um, because that might be interesting and definitely be able to invest Parata in that company. But I would say it's trust, which is very, very important at the beginning. And if you, you know, if you want to build up a portfolio, you might want to have like a vanilla term sheet, as we call it, like, a, you know, a basic, the basic terms that you want to ask for. And of course, it's up to negotiations, but, um, but it might be useful on the, on the longer term as an angel investor. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a this is a great uh, these are these are great great final remarks. Um, I think that uh, if anybody is looking for uh, some kind of examples of of these uh, um, term sheet terms and uh, and other documents, I think I can recommend uh, Venture Deals, which is uh, Ben Feld, uh, Brett Feld's uh, work uh, that that pretty much summarizes a lot of the documentation and the processes and the structure of an investment. Uh, obviously, so far we were very much focusing on the, I guess, on the human element and also on 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 selection and and the, and the context um, in which uh, uh, startups operate. But when you get when you get down to the point that you actually have to negotiate uh, terms of your of your um, uh, investment contract, um, Brad, uh, Brad Feld's uh, venture deals is a very good good example, and they also have a lot of, uh, I think, easy to use uh, templates. Obviously, that's the U.S. context. Uh, but um, I think that the, the similar, uh, similar, such similar things exist uh, 
uh, by tech stars uh, on the on the European arena also. Uh, looking at the clock, sorry, it's, uh, sorry Imra, just uh, just one thing. Uh, I want to drop uh, a link here because uh, you might be aware of that. Uh, uh, I um, I sort of uh, analyzed all these uh, terms uh, in the Hungarian. Yes, you did. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you can find all those articles uh, here. Uh, I drop you a link. You can read about each term of the term sheet here. Okay, in Hungarian, obviously, with Hungarian uh, legal terms. And I think we Good. also, um, sorry, one more thing, uh, Hungarian Venture Capital Association, while I was um, in the board there, uh, we, uh, yeah, we came out, we published uh, also like a vanilla term sheet. Um, to be to be honest, I don't exactly know now where to look for it, but I think if you put in HVCA vanilla term sheet or term sheet template, you'll find it, or I can look for it as well, but it might be useful. Yeah, and, and so that I can also add something, um, with the uh, Hungarian Innovation Federation, uh, recently Judith Koshai uh, came up with a uh, with, with an assessment of um, uh, investment terms in Hungary in the past year. So I can also circulate uh, that document among uh, among the uh, participants here in a in a, in a similar um, link as uh, as Peter and uh, Peter did and as uh, Eva mentioned. All right, so it's uh, five to eight. Um, I think it was very. Uh, very eventful and a lot of uh, a lot of content in these uh, in these two hours and I'm happy that so many of you uh, showed up here um, and I don't know what's what's the situation on Facebook I'm I'm, I'm only here on, on Zoom but I'm very happy to see the turnout so uh, thank you all for uh, uh, for you know uh, giving two years two uh, hours of your life uh, to this uh, to this event I think it's go it's going to be or it was um, uh, useful and it's going to be uh, useful for the uh, for the future. Uh, Esther, do you want to say something? Ed? Yeah, anything? you know, I really enjoyed <laughs> the the session and, and the, the questions uh, as well. And uh, definitely we will uh, continue. And thank you, Eva. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Imre. So uh, we will continue our monthly sessions and and. Uh, we have to make uh, Central Europe a unique place, uh, a place for uh, for the whole world. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Attila, for the technical background. Bye bye.